Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, lovely to see you guys here. I hope more and more people are going to come in. Um, my name is Samira Ayangar and I'm here as a core team member of SMART. Uh, I've been working in this wonderful theater world for the last 20 years um, in, in various avatars. Um, and uh, we've been with, and been with SMART since its founding. Um, today's uh, session is uh, SMART in the Round is a session on community. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about SMART before I jump into, into what we're gonna be doing today. Um, we founded SMART, uh, uh, we launched our first SMART session in 2015. Uh, SMART was founded, uh, it's, it stands for Strategic Management in the Art of Theater. And we founded it to help, uh, uh, you know, to support theater groups in finding creative ways of management so that they could really thrive in their own chosen environment with their own chosen work. Um, last year during the pandemic, we decided to launch uh, this conversation series, which we're calling Smart in the Round. And the idea was to look beyond practice uh, and have conversations on uh, creativity, culture, and context, uh, looking at how theater people uh, and their practice impacts other spaces, looking at how other spaces impact theater um, and having conversations with people in theater and uh, connected to theater uh, for all of us to enjoy and, and, uh, and hear. Uh, our first series uh, was last year and this is the first conversation in our series this year. It's going to be a series of three conversations starting today, one a month. Today, it's going to be on community. Uh, tomorrow on... Um, uh, sorry, uh, next month on space and the month after on experiments. Uh, today's session has been inspired by the fact that it's uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, theater people have actually been doing some really inspiring, amazing work, uh, relief work in very, very creative ways. They've hit the ground hard, they've come together. Uh, they found very many ways to help not only artists, but also other people. And we thought, um, this is something we'd like to acknowledge and celebrate and listen to the stories of four of these people uh, from different parts of the country, uh, how they have been uh, taking relief to various people from their own locations. Um, so uh, before, uh, so what I'd like to do now is that I'd like to invite on board the four wonderful panelists that we have. Uh, Anurupa Roy, if you would come on, puppeteer, director and puppet designer. Uh, Nisha Abdullah, Anurupa Roy, yeah, Nisha Abdullah. Can I have my team bring them into the gallery? Uh, Nisha Abdullah, who's a storyteller, playwright, director, and educator who's based in Bangalore. Anurupa is based in Delhi. Shonjai Ganguly, who is a theater artist and theater activist. He's based in Modham Gram, West Bengal. And Sapan Saran, poet, writer, and director based in Mumbai. Wonderful. I don't know if everybody can be seen in the gallery. Uh, I can can uh, can the audience see everyone? Okay. I'm going to uh, move on with some house rules right now. Um, Please, uh, just before we jump into the session and listen to these wonderful speakers, uh, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, please uh, enter your queries in the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking queries after all the speakers have uh, presented and after I've asked them a few questions. Um, the queries on FB will also be shared by one of our team uh, who is looking on FB. So please, if you're watching this on FB Live, please put your questions there and it will be shared on the Q&A box and we will address them. Uh, please keep an eye on the chat. We'll be sharing various kinds of information on the chat. And also feel free to use uh, the chat and the FB comments for your thoughts, insights, inputs. You know, uh, the only, th only thing we ask of you is that everything is civil. Even if you have a point of disagreement or anything like that, please keep this as a civil discourse between us. Um, this session should go on for about 15 minutes to an hour. And after that, we'll open up for audience questions and we'll see how long we want to take it. Okay. Wonderful. So if we can jump right in, uh, I'd like to begin by inviting Shonjai Ganguly uh, to talk about his work. Um, Shonjai, 
uh, your work with Jana Shanshkriti, Jana Shanshkriti doing forum theater, your work means that you are essentially embedded in community. Your teams come from the community, they perform for the community and they get into discourse and debate with the community. And as you've said before, that you have a 10 to 30 year relationship with all the communities that you've been working with. And, and while you're spread across the country, you're most widely spread across West Bengal. The thing is that, uh, and you know, you had mentioned that because you're so embedded in community and actually when there was a crisis, you felt you had to respond. Uh, but the thing is that uh, in West Bengal, you got a double whammy because soon after the pandemic started, uh, you also got hit by Amphan. Uh, so could you uh, give us an insight into the work that you did with your communities uh, and the communities, the various communities that played a key role in your relief work and the direction that your theater activism is now going to take given what the experience that you have gone through. Over to you, Shanjoy. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> thanks to everybody. Um, actually, I, I will never, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity um, to explain what is community actually. We are talking about community. And it is true, we are creating a community through theater by extending an intellectual space, a democratic intellectual space where all of us are arguing, debating, discussing. Um, theater is extending an intellectual space where we are discussing not to win against others, but to understand the path, but to construct the road, the path to follow. So, therefore, since this is not a debate uh, to win, this is not done. And since it is an argument uh, to collectively understand what we know, it's a journey from knowing to understanding, it actually converges us as opposed to alienate us. So, it, it does not alienate, isolate, separate, but it converges, it unites us because all of us collectively try to understand the, 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 the reason, the truth, I mean, all of us try to construct the path to be followed in order to address the operation soon or portrayed in the book. So uh, my question is, we are, we are talking about community, but we have seen the dysfunctional uh, behavior of the community. Also, we have seen functional behavior of the community, which has, which made us very optimistic. So uh, why did we see dysfunctional um, community? Some in, in, in West Bengal, we always witness the pre-election violence, post-election violence. And during COVID, the panic was such that people were avoiding to each other. So we, have, we always, we often see the dysfunctional community. And if you see, even when we uh, work in the trade union sector, since our theater is theater of the office, we go to the office, hand over theatrical means to them so that they can make their own theater. So uh, it, is, it is not actually theater for the office, it is theater of the office. But we don't have any problem with theater for the office. So when you go and work with the workers, we see the dysfunctional nature of the community. Because when we see 500 workers demanding the higher wages, everybody thinks that my wage will increase. So the collective, uh, the self-interest uh, drives them to come together. So I call it collective self-interest. It's not a true collectivism. Because after the wage is increased, they go and fight against each other on the line of religion. They uh, differentiate each other on the basis of caste. They differentiate each other on the basis of the political party line. So often we see the dysfunctional community. It appears as if it's a collective action, but it is not actually a collective action. Like, for example, when we speak in a circle, where very often it becomes, uh, it appears as dialogue, but actually that's a uh, appearance. The reality is there are multiple monologues because I am not listening to my friend. When he or she is speaking, I am calculating, I am thinking how soon after he or she finishes her presentation, what should be our thought, what should be my, my argument to conflict or to complement. So we want to show our intellectual power while discussing in a circle. So apparently it becomes a, a monologue, but actually the reality is there are multiple monologues. It's not dialogue. I mean, appearance is dialogue.
no? but the reality is multiple monologues. So in various ways, actually, we feel the need to evolve as a community. And here theater has a role and our theater has been creating a true community where there is no divisive elements. In our place, in our, uh, the assembly constituencies we work had never witnessed uh, pre-election, post-election violence, uh, problem of giving nominations, this kind of things did not happen there. And there are studies which shows that uh, even domestic violence at the physical level uh, was not found in the area we work. So basically our attempt is to uh, create a community, a uh, true community where there will be no divisive element. And we do it through theater, bike and through theater we create the space intellectual space where we script intellectual power actors spectators they script intellectual power and that intellectual power breaks the passivity within the actors and spectators and they transform themselves into act evist i call the actors become act evist and the spectators as my teacher boal says spectator the spectators become spect activists so this activist and spectacular they continue the theater off stage. So on stage, we skip intellectual power. Off stage, we act. So acting and activism, they get combined. And this is how actually we <clears throat> form the community. So now <clears throat> we have been practicing this theater in many villages for the last 30 years. So 30 years uh, in the villages, if you go there, you will see uh, three generations observing our theater. Grandfather, grandmother, uh, son, uh, the sons and daughters, and the grand grandparents, grandparents, grandfather, and their sons. So three generations, uh, they watch our theater. That means they have been watching this kind of theater for last 30 years. <clears throat> so, and we have uh, experienced working on stage and off stage with them for a long time. Therefore, when the COVID crisis came, uh, and then uh, in, 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 the, in the middle of the COVID crisis, the Ampan, uh, this, uh, this thing came, cyclone. So we could not, uh, you know, we, we, it was very difficult for us to be quiet, to sit uh, at our house. So we risked. And uh, uh, this, this is how we express the solidarity. You know, I, I can remember Che Guevara's quote that solidarity means running the same risk. So we decided to take the risk. We went to the people, we went to our spectators because they were in trouble. That was the point why we had to go because our relationship with our spectators is very old. And uh, we have always seen theater as an art of creating connection, theater as an art of establishing relationship. So therefore uh, our relationship with the spectators, uh, for them actually we exist. We exist because they exist. So therefore, uh, it was our existential problem. So we had to go to our space. That is the main rationale why we did go. And now, what did you, what did you find here? The one, one very important uh, thing that, that was clear to us, we were exposed with the problem of the migrant workers, you see. And uh, we knew that people migrate from our villages to Chennai, to Delhi, the other destinations, uh, Kerala, they go there, Maharashtra, they go there, we knew. But we didn't, we didn't know really uh, the condition they go through, the problem they go through, the oppression they go through, we didn't know about it. So COVID exposed this, uh, the, the problem of the migrant workers. So many of our spectators family, they had migrant workers. So uh, when they came back to the quarantine center, when we went uh, with our relief program with food uh, supplements, you know, uh, to our to our people during Ampan, when the, their houses were destroyed, we went uh, to reconstruct their houses. So while doing this, we came across migrant workers and their experiences, and from their experiences, we dis we thought that this uh, issue, this is a real issue we must address because, uh, you know, they have no legal coverage. They, they have no, uh, I mean, suroksa, what you call the protection. They have no protection. Uh, so we must do something. So what we decided, and now uh, we have uh, uh, composed, we have scripted a couple of plays. Uh, we have been performing them in uh, South 24 Pagnas in, in, in Purulia. So uh, 
we are actually interacting with the migrant workers and their families. So we are trying to understand the depth of the problem, the minute dimensions of this problem. So after uh, performing uh, the shows, and at the same time, the relief work is continuing. We are still doing the relief work. We are still reaching 600 families with food grains uh, twice a month. It's, it's going on, you know. But at the same time, we are also performing forum theater. And uh, now we realize that we need to know the laws, existing laws. There are laws, my state interested migrant workers law, there are uh, laws passed in 1928, 1973. So all these laws we didn't know. And we have a Federation of Theater of the Office that Janasanskriti initiated in 2006, uh, where trade unions, unorganized, working with unorganized sectors, they were part of this Federation of Theater of the Office because they decided to practice forum theater in order to democratize the politics. So we actually remembered them and we actually uh, wanted their help. So they trained us, those state union leaders working uh, in unorganized sector trained us. They, uh, in, for, they let us know that there are laws, but there are lacunas. So many, so many big lacunas. So you can't really do anything. Even though there is law, but there's no meaning of it. So now, based on this experience, to, to project the loopholes and the lacunas in the existing laws, we are developing the stories. And now with these stories, we are going to the legislators in the panchayat level with the local intellectuals, local lawyers, and we are doing a theater called legislative theater, and we are asking audience what kind of amendment you think is very important to really uh, address these lacunas in the existing laws. So that is legislative theater. Uh, and this uh, Janasanskriti, as a first exponent of theater of the oppressed in India, uh, started this practice in 1991. Uh, but this 30 years, last 30 years, we never practiced legislative theater. But this time, after being expo exposed with the uh, migrant workers' problems, we have decided to uh, go for legislative theater. So our now we are doing it. We are collecting the amendments. We will go to Delhi also in the, in the next year, the end of the, uh, December next year. We will be gathering all the unions, uh, addressing the unorganized sector's problem. We will be doing the legislative theater. We are in touch with lawyers in Supreme Court, lawyers in Calcutta High Courts. So those uh, the amendments we are getting from the people are being collected, documented, audiovisually and in written form. And then we are taking it, we will take it to the lawyers, we will draft a law, and we will send those uh, drafted law to the legislators uh, at the state level and the, at the center level. This is our plan. But the entire plan evolved because there was COVID. You know, uh, uh, that <laughs> I'm sounding quite uh, funny, but we, we were exposed to these uh, problems of our society and decided to practice legislative theater. And this is going to be the first time in India we are going to practice the legislative theater. Am I? Thank you, Shantar. Thank oh. you, yes. Huh? Yes, the yeah. time is up. So the, thank you. And we can come back to a further discussion on this later on in the in the conversation. But thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, you know, um, there, there is also been all the other work that you've done with the actual rebuilding of houses, desalination, all of that practical everyday work that has been going on. Yes. Constructed. yes. And our yeah. global community theater of the oppress from 80 different countries. Some of them are listening probably here. They yeah. came forward and collected a lot of money for us to yeah. repair our center. So I'll come back. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you with those questions later because we'd like to know how all of that happened. But thank you so much. I would like to now call Nisha. Uh, uh, Nisha, you also have been working closely with communities, uh, mostly with young people. Uh, and very interestingly, you've been working with people who are from very privileged backgrounds, but also people who are usually marginalized socially. Uh, and, you, and for you, theater, uh, working with them with theater has also been a means of getting them to think about uh, uh, issues of social, uh, exploring issues of social justice and of, and of crossing a bridge between what you call the two separate bubbles that exist, right? But, uh, but, 
but in the pandemic what has happened is that uh, because of the isolation nature of the pandemic and because digital has become the key way for us to connect uh, what in a you sort of got thrown out of the work with marginalized communities uh, and that has been a struggle for you but at the same time especially with the second wave you uh, you and your your partner who's a who's a psychotherapist have recognized sort of needs that you feel you had to address and therefore come up with the deep listening circle uh, which has been doing fantastic work and i would really love you to share with us uh, you know the how the why uh, of deep listening circle please over to you thank you samira and uh, thanks everyone who is watching listening interested in this conversation um before i start i just want to um acknowledge the volunteers who've been crucial to both Bangalore Pledge Project, which is the food relief um, initiative. And, um, you know, they, they're not here, but they're critical to that. Um, and I want to take names because this is about community and that is important. So Vahida, Imran, Ayapa, uh, Zaidan, uh, Akbar, Munawar, uh, Rabia. Uh, these are people that uh, without whom the food relief you know, work wouldn't have happened. Some of them joined the food relief uh, volunteering last year. Um, some of them this year. Uh, everyone who was with us last year just continued on with this year. Um, the Deep Listening Circle really started uh, just out of this rage about what was happening. Um, Delhi was going through the madness. All those apocalyptic scenes were happening. And we were tracking the numbers. Um, some, a lot of us who were in rehearsal were concerned about what this means. A lot of us had planned for like 50% occupancy shows and things like that. So we were tracking the numbers and there was like an impending, you know, a sense of impending doom um, in Bangalore as well, that we are going to follow Delhi's, you know, um, way uh, with the lack of beds and oxygen and all of that. Um, so, and, you know, while, you know, friends in Delhi and uh, family of friends and, and people in Bangalore around me were all dealing with all of this uh, very real, very intense uh, feelings. What was happening on the outside, of course, was the most massive, you know, head messing kind of gaslighting from the leadership. Um, absolutely no acknowledgement of reality. They seem to be living in some kind of parallel realm that had nothing to do with what we were going through. And so, uh, Shalini and I, Shalini is the co-imaginer of Deep Listening Circle with me. Uh, when we were just venting about some of this, um, we were in the throes of food relief in the morning and then medical relief, so, you know, in the second half of the day. So we were also feeling all of this, you know, intense um, feelings and felt like there was really no place to come together and place these feelings, just kind of look at them and sit with them and acknowledge them. Um, everyone seemed to be going through, you know, their own um, messed up uh, situations, their own very specific responses to the second wave. And this was coming on the back of, of course, right from the first wave, you know, so people also seem to have lesser resilience this time round. I know I felt that way and Shalini felt that way. And so, we, you know, we wanted to reach out uh, into community, firstly for ourselves, like we needed a space where we could feel like our realities were being acknowledged. And so we were very clear that this is coming from a need that we face ourselves. Um, April 30th was when we had our first uh, listening circle and um, we kind of approached it with a let's see, you know, um, mindset. We don't know whether people need this, want this. We felt the need, but that doesn't mean that others want it. Uh, the first session itself, we had to kind of close, um, uh, close registrations because, you know, it was getting a bit much. We had decided to cap it at 20 per session, but, um, I, but now we take only like 12 per session and I'll tell, I mean, I'll tell you why as well. Uh, in a bit but um so what we do in the listening circle because we would get a lot of questions about what is it actually what we would do is just you know enter this zoom room uh, and each uh, week people who want to come in uh, have to register separately so it's not like this continuous uh, week on thing every week we have a different group that comes together uh, over time some have been regulars 
uh, some come in once every two, three weeks, and inevitably in every session there will be new faces as well. Um, what we do is we come together and then we prepare our bodies and our psyche for uh, listening and for uh, sharing. So this usually involves some breath work, some, um, some grounding work, uh, simple reflection and naming of feelings that one has, you know, one is in uh, right now, one has experienced in the last week. Um, and we were bringing in, Shalini and I, we were bringing in a lot of things from our theatre practice. Shalini was bringing her, you know, tools from her psychotherapy practice, from her gestalt practice. Um, so we were kind of figuring this out as we go along, but we were very clear that we have to prepare the body and the mind in some way. So we do that together as, you know, as a, as a Zoom room, and then we break out into, um, into two groups. And the actual listening circle happens there. And... Uh, we're in our 17th week, uh, day after tomorrow will be our 17th week. And it amazes me each week uh, how different uh, each you know, week's uh, session is. Uh, but no matter who is there and what is happening, um, at the end of the session, what a lot of us check out with is a sense of feeling heard and seen and truly having someone to witness um, you know, our uncertainties and our fears. Um, we lay out some guidelines very clearly because a lot of our experiences of the pandemic is different. And so it's important to honor that. So we do lay out, you know, guidelines and it, it is a facilitated uh, session. Uh, we do contain it in some way. Um, but, uh, but overall what happens is really that we open the floor to anyone who wants to share who feels the need to unburden and the rest of us hold space for that person. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the most surprising parts of the listening circle week on week is how comfortable so many of us are just sitting in silence. Um, there are often people who, you know, who check out with, um, with uh, statements like, I thought I'll want to fill in the gap, you know, and fill in that silence. But um, there is a certain ease that, um, that is, you know, present with silence as well, and that's beautiful to witness. It, it is a, it is a sort of um, quietening of sorts that people have found in this space. Um, yeah, um, we we plan to keep this going for as long as the need exists in us and um, as a community. Uh, next week, we are offering uh, a session in Canada. Uh, one of our uh, Kannada theater mates, Rashmi Ravikumar, will be holding space in Kannada. We hope maybe there will be other, you know, languages that we can like, we can hold space in. Um, overall, the the kind of um, the intensity of the second wave back in uh, May and June uh, sh sort of shifted. You know, it. it um, well, I guess COVID is still on, but it kind of became invisibilized a bit for us. It moved out into other areas. So the needs of the space kind of changed a bit. There was some morphing. But what's, um, what's interesting to have seen is that while the first half of you know, our sessions so far, of the 17 sessions so far, were like very intense, immediate, there was an urgent need to acknowledge what was happening and uh, and to acknowledge these fears and these deep uncertainties about having to go through this for the second time round, it almost like in a, in a time loop. But now what we're seeing really is this lingering you know, loss that people have to deal with, um, whether it is shifts in relationships, um, a lot of people who uh, are not comfortable at home, who don't feel protected at home, but are forced to be there. Uh, we have a lot of people from tier, uh, uh, beyond tier two cities who come in who are um, who had to move out of cities and go back into their homes and they're just not feeling safe there anymore and so um, you know spaces like the listening circle and um, other reading groups and um, you know viewing circles that you know that people have put together in this time also become a way for them to connect with people and find community uh, outside of the you know, physical space that they're in. Um, so the listening circle has been many things to many people. Uh, and a lot of them acknowledge that 
Sometimes it's just to be with people who uh, will just let you be and are not demanding, you know, constantly um, something out of you or, or demanding energy out of you. Um, yeah, so I'll stop here. Um, like Samira is looming. <laughs> I'll stop here, but um, I'm really happy to, you know, if anyone is curious about this or if anyone wants to start their own, um, I'm happy to answer questions or figure this out with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. I often wonder uh, that you guys are running this week to week. So you are the two consistent people yeah. who, are, who are going through this. And I wonder how you manage uh, your own health, you know, your own, because it's not only whatever each of us is indi individually be feeling, but then you're hearing so many stories from so many people. So perhaps at some point we can also address that yes. as sure. a response. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, Nisha. Thank you. I'd uh, now like to call on Anurupa Roy. Uh, Anurupa, uh, you know, as, as uh, yes, hello, hello. So Anurupa, uh, you know, in keeping with, uh, with yourself, with your personality, you have been involved in a variety of uh, uh, relief efforts. It seems like one after the other after the other, but what's been interesting is that it's also been a diversity of work. Uh, some that you have done with your group Katkata alone, you've done fundraising by putting your own plays up online. Uh, but you've also come together with theater people in Delhi uh, to fundraise uh, as well as to distribute uh, relief. And now you're also connecting to people across the country through uh, your own connection with Unima. So for me, um, you know, it, it seems the pattern of your work seems to be of uh, being able to pull together very quickly informal networks. Uh, to to deliver the to deliver relief to the people who you identified as the people you want to you know you want to bring relief to, uh, so I was wondering if you can give us an insight into how you were able to do this, how all of you have been able to do this, what you think has helped you do this, uh, with the speed and the ease with which you have done it, and of course you know share with us the relief work you've done while you're while you're telling us about this. Um, hi hi hello everyone, uh, I've been listening to uh, uh, Shondra and uh, Nisha and. Uh, it's it's interesting the kind of resonances we have with uh, people during during the pandemic. Um, I think I just want to I want to um, just give a little bit of a background. When um, the lockdown first took place, we were in the midst of rehearsing a production which was supposed to premiere now. It's going to premiere in September. So uh, and there was a lot of work and tours and um, I'm saying this because I know many theater companies, performing art companies had the same situation, everything came to a screeching halt. So I think the first thing was the shock of it all. Uh, and also um, this whole uh, business of believing that, you know, this is going to be over soon and uh, uh, that this is a temporary uh, situation. Um, so in the beginning, we were also all, almost treating it like, oh, this is a small uh, stopgap, almost a little break or holiday. Uh, soon enough, the actual nature of the crisis started to unfold and one realized that it was actually a really big socio-economic political crisis. Uh, I live on uh, the ring road, uh, the arterial road of New Delhi, actually at the cross section of two very big roads. And both roads, one leads to UP and one leads to um, uh, Haryana and Punjab. Um, so the day of the declaration of the lockdown is uh, we, we could hear noises all night. And by the next morning, it had become clear that people had started walking home. And these were uh, workers who were leaving the city, uncertain about their future. A lot of them evicted by their landlords, uh, uh, many unsure that they would be able to pay rents. And they were daily wage workers. They were leaving with children, families, everything. And I think um, uh, almost all of the cities experienced this. And I remember that the entire neighborhood was in this shock. And we all spent a day in wondering what is happening because it wasn't one or two, it was thousands of people walking on that main road, all buses and everything had been stopped. Um, the next morning, somebody in the neighborhood had jumped into action and you know, this big kitchen had started. And I think that kick started something uh, for me uh, because it was an individual endeavor. He'd gone from door to door, collected vessels, collected people, collected money. And uh, we started cooking and uh, we were helping distribute food 
And this went on for about six or seven days and literally thousands of people were eating and stopping there. And this was happening at several neighborhoods. Some people were on scooters distributing food and bananas and milk and uh, water and such like. And um, it's at this point, one felt the need to uh, raise money. And the only way we know how to do it is through our performances. So we immediately started a digital festival online with uh, Katkatha's shows, but uh, played digitally. We'd never done this before. None of our shows had ever been designed for the digital space. Um, and once we started uh, presenting these uh, shows, we asked people for donations. There were no tickets. We just said, come and watch the shows and give what you want to. This is the purpose. A lot of funding started to flow in from our audiences, mostly people who followed us on Facebook, Instagram, and the generosity of people was quite overwhelming. And at this point, we started to get also a lot of phone calls from our immediate community, which is the puppeteers. The first set of phone calls were from Rajasthan, which was from the Katputli community in Nagor, in Udaipur, in Jaipur. Uh, then Shadipur in Delhi, which uh, some of you may know has been demolished recently. And a lot of the puppeteers, which is um, roughly about 2,400 families, are now in transit camps. So we had crisis calls from all transit camps. And they not only have puppeteers, but they have madaris, which are street performers, acrobats, circus work uh, uh, artists. So there were, uh, there were many of these uh, calls. And uh, it became really clear that what was needed was food and dry rations. Um, so many people were setting this up. And while we were giving out dry rations, uh, we were supporting especially the Madari community because it's very isolated. It's in the in, in, in Ghaziabad district. And then some of the puppetry families, which were not in the main camp, which is in Anand Parvat. So we were supporting about 140 families. And we came to know about other people who were doing similar things. So very loose network started to come together. Uh, and this was uh, uh, rations for the month and medicines mostly. Um, at this point, we realized that it makes sense to pool in resources. Very soon after that, the Delhi uh, Kalaka Relief Network was formed. So there was um, uh, several people in it. Uh, Kuldeep from Atelier, who'd already been doing this with the theater community. There was Gargi Bharatwaj and uh, Komita. Uh, Komita works with uh, Janam. Uh, there was Supriya, there was uh, uh, Malika Taneja, there were lots of individuals who uh, wanted to work, were already working. We then managed to do another Keto fundraiser, and this became a relief for uh, Delhi based artists. But calls were coming from actors, dancers, um, mime artists, sculptors, uh, soap. We had almost 75 people on the list and the idea was to support them for about three or four months, which we, which we did. Um, so there were several different things running simultaneously. And at this point, uh, we also realized that there's a need to continue to work and explore the possibility of work online. Are we going to sit at home? It was, it was not possible to rehearse. It was not possible to meet. We run a community theater in our studio space. We had to shut it down. We had to tell the children, this is shutting down over the weekends. We also realized a lot of our children had walked home with their parents. So there was a general need within the artist community, within our group. There was this uh, almost uh, uh, this feeling of depression, this feeling of this is never going to end. Three months had already passed or two months had already passed. And it became absolutely imperative that we started to work. And so we started to create performances initially, like I said, presenting our work digitally. And then we started to create work for the digital space. And in the interim, I met uh, a girl who was walking home while we were distributing rations. And her, um, uh, her story was very interesting because she was 11 years old. Her name was Sitara and she was wearing her best pink party frock. And I was very curious about why this child is wearing her best clothes. And she said, um, because we are going on a picnic. And it really struck me. And I uh, uh, told this to a friend in Bombay, Aditi Mendi Ratta, who wrote a little story about the girl. And uh, there was, I felt the need to tell the story and I had nothing at home. I wasn't in my studio, just had some paper and scissors and 
some black markers and I started to draw the story and cut it out. And it became a little film called Girl in the Pink Frog shot on my mobile phone. And I'm not a cameraman and not a digital person. And uh, this was the beginning of something for me. And then the people in the Katkata group saw it and slowly we began to make little puppet films. Then we started to do digital workshops. We started to have more and more meetings. It was very important to check in with each other. A lot of people were really falling out of, um, you know, through the cracks and falling out of the system. So our work started to catch up. And I did something I never thought I'd do. I, I moved to the digital space to perform with puppets. Uh, but but it was very exciting. And as we started doing this workshops, many people started to call us, especially schools, school teachers, who were like, how do we cope with Zoom and, and teaching children on Zoom? So um, we uh, started inventing ways of, you know, changing this rectangular box and making it more exciting. Um, and uh, more and more such teacher training programs started and children started to come and join workshops and um, uh, students are asked to join workshops like this. So this sort of process began and we were going to start a co-production with a German company called Helios Theater, which had completely come to a, a, a standstill. But Helios very generously said, no, continue the work. We'll do pro two productions. We'll work in Germany and you work in India. And so we decided to create a digital performance called Tila Purkarakshas, um, based a little bit on uh, Hirok Rajat Deshe and with paper cutouts. And one thing led to another and we started to discover this incredible digital live feed space and that has continued to grow for us. In terms of the relief work, sorry, Samira, I've probably- uh, That's okay, you've got another minute or so, go ahead. So in terms of the relief work, we are now in a position where the Puppeteers Union is continuously supporting puppet theater families scattered across India as we speak there are eight families in Tamil Nadu of leather shadow puppeteers who are creating 10 minute documentaries and little puppet shows for us, for UNIMA, which is the puppeteers union body. And um, they are being given small uh, funding for it. And for this, the overall puppeteers union, which is in 120 countries across the world, um, they have been donating for this cause. And uh, we've managed to support at this point about 16 puppet families and this is an ongoing uh, program so i'll end here thank you thank you anurupa we'll come back with more questions and i'm sure there's going to be more uh thank you very much i'd now like to call on sapan saran to please join me here um sapan you guys had a big dream that you wanted theater those those to be a one-stop resource center for uh, theater artists in need uh, but what was, uh, you know, just ask for any problem and you can support for help. And what's been really interesting in your story is how you started with that dream. And then you didn't actually start out with a specific community that you were working for. You actually found the community because you really wanted to get to people who you felt uh, really lost livelihood. Um, and what has happened also, which has been really interesting, is how you've organically responded to need. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you decided who you want to support and then how you've managed to the variety of work you've done and keep responding to what has been addressed as need uh, by the community. Right. Thanks, Amira. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I think um, I have limited time, so I'll quickly get into it. But I think there are several factors that uh, uh, are responsible for the work that we've been able to do, and I'll touch upon uh, some of those quickly. Um, the first point, as uh, Samira rightly said, was the identification of the community. Um, so it's not like we didn't identify the broad community to begin with. We were At the onset, we were very clear that we want to do this for the theater community, simply because we are unrepresented, we are uh, you know, largely invisible, um, and, and it's our community. Um, however, within this community, uh, it took us some time to identify the sections that were the most distressed. Um, and then reaching out to them took some time. Um, and I'm talking about the backstage workers, the front of house workers, the very crucial support system that we have, uh, the set walas, the istri walas, the light uh, people, sound, makeup, uh, you know, doorkeepers, ushers, and so on. Um, and just to give you context here, um, most backstage workers in Mumbai are organized by an association called the Rangmanch Kamgar Association. Um, and, and these workers work in theaters across languages. 
so as we know, there are nine to ten different uh, uh, language theatre practices in Mumbai, and they work in all of them. So there's there's you know Anil Bobre is going to give provide lights to us, to Kwasar, to you know five other Marathi, Gujarati, uh, Kannad plays, and so on. So we were basically looking at um, about 750 backstage workers. Uh, 180 front of house workers and their families, about uh, 40 families of folk performers, uh, trans performers, and several individual actors and artists. Um, and I think that's close to like 1,000 families that we are uh, responsible for at the moment. Um, the second point, I think, uh, it's a planning decision, I think, that um, you know, shaped certain things. Uh, the fact that you know one had to keep in mind the overall impact of the pandemic and not only the immediate one. Um, so our community has been out of work literally for 18 months now. Um, and the backstage workers, they depend entirely on theater as their source of livelihood. Uh, they depend on per show payments, they depend on uh, bulk work, and that's how uh, they live. So the, so the economic distress is huge here. Uh, and it, this, this was leading to all sorts of different problems. Um, so we therefore wanted to provide a sort of a sustained overall support uh, to them. And I think that is what led to the various things that Samira mentioned. So food security was uh, primary. Uh, also medicinal support, not only for COVID, but also for non-COVID um, patients. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people were making these tough calls, ki, uh, you know, apni dawai khaen ya apne pure parivar ko khana um, So that, and then also um, support towards hospitalization and so on. Uh, I think largely, there were two things at play. Uh, the one was the fact that we were looking at the calamity in its entirety, and the second was that we were operating in a in a world in the theater world that we understood the functioning of. Uh, so because of that, it became easier to you know see the concerns as they arose. Uh, for instance, the latest project right now is about reskilling because many of the workers and artists have already uh, started doing small businesses. So. So, you know, there is a plan to sort of work on skill training and entrepreneurial uh, awareness training um, for, for small family run businesses. Um, the third thing that I have to mention here is, is, is uh, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming amount of love and support that Theatre Dosa has received from the immediate theatre community and also from um, society at large, you know. Uh, people have volunteered with their skills, their time, their money, their resources, expertise, everything possible. Uh, theater people have done shows, they've done online shows, they've sent their entire ticket sales, they've done workshops and sent money. Um, it's like the entire community was on standby, you know, and, and you could call anyone up and you could uh, ask for help. Just phenomenal. Um, but not only the theater community, it was public in general, was very, very generous. Uh, they donated generously. Uh, and I, I think uh, in our experience, um, you know, I, I think people, people do have an inherent uh, faith in the arts and uh, in the theater. Um, the fourth thing, and I'm, I'm going to wrap after this, is, uh, is a point actually which has shaped the way we work. Um, I think we took into account uh, the immense psychological stress that uh, everyone was under. Uh, and you have to understand that our people are not used to the idea of asking for help or for anything, you know. Uh, so people's dignity was of importance. Uh, so just providing relief was not enough, you know, how and in what spirit uh, was it provided was equally important. Um, so what we essentially wanted to do was to put systems in place uh, that uh, ensured that the entire process was as stress-free, as easy, as flexible as possible. Um, so if you need, the prescribed medicines will come to you, will be home delivered by a chemist in your area. Uh, theater those uh, ration distribution days are handled completely by the workers. There's no third party intervention. They organize the entire thing themselves. Um, and I'm going to end with a, a story of a a 70 year old, very senior um, painter, uh, a backdrop painter. And on chatting with him, I realized that, uh, you know, he had stopped taking medicines for some chronic illness. He was not open to uh, discussing or talking about it. And, and there were other issues and problems that one could sense at home. So it was quite complex. And we decided the best course for him would be if we can, you know, find him a donor. Um, so I, I spoke to one of our contributors who used to provide financial aid of up to 15,000 rupees to a family if we identified them for him. And I presented this case to him and the donor agreed. 
uh, and and we just needed the painter's account details and the transfer would be done no questions asked he refused so 3 days i spent trying to convince him but he did not accept the aid i think this is the level of uh, self respect that people have and we had to tread very carefully be respectful of that um yeah these were some of the principles that drove the work and we were also learning and adapting as we went along um there's a small presentation samira if uh, you'd like to we can see some photographs if you want if there's time thank you sapan please stay on uh, this uh, i mean it's phenomenal the work that you guys are doing and it's ongoing work right it's not work that is uh, like and and that's in fact a question for all of you like ongoing uh, you know uh, a continuing work as the pandemic rages on if i can invite all the panelists onto the screen uh, and if you can give me uh, the gallery view darshana uh, then i would like to um, uh then i would like to uh just ask a few questions and then throw it open uh to to the audience uh but sapan i wanted to get uh back to you for shonjoy da could you turn your camera on shonjoy see i am trying but the host has asked you to start your video well no i can start ah perfect you're with us wonderful uh So Sapan, if I can just ask you, uh, you know, the the Theatre Dos work has uh, you brought together a lot of people to to work with you on on Theatre Dos. Your team is is quite large, and they've come from all over, is what you told me. Uh, it, you know, I was wondering. Uh, it struck me that this is voluntary work. Everybody's under pressure during the pandemic. Theatre people are really under pressure because we've lost, you know, what we do, right? Um, and I was curious, uh, you know, how, how what were the kind of decisions you had to take in terms of the time you put in like you know how did you guys negotiate your self time and self care with this work that you had to do um so i think uh, samira the answer to that partly lies in the way we very quickly managed to organize uh, this uh, i think that made it possible for uh, many of us to continue doing the work um so just to give you an idea of the organization uh, we started with a small core group of 5 to 6 uh, people there was kalyani mule Uh, Sunil Chandbag, Manjri Bhopala, Akshay Shimpi, Samyat Ripathi, um, and myself. Uh, and in a matter of say, two days or so, we realized, no, 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 we need many more people to join us. Uh, and uh, eventually, I'll I have a list of the teams that were working on the project actually very quickly just to take you through that. Uh, so there was an outgoing call team and incoming call team, a team for posters, editing, publicity, a team for uh, outreach for different languages. There were eight to nine different languages. um uh, translators and voice over team there was medicine team which had to do a very detailed work uh, with prescriptions and stuff so that uh, and then there were these resource building teams uh, which is you know which is most of the work initially uh, and what we did was that every person focused on uh, one or two specific areas uh, so manjri specialized in meal support to covid patients uh, kalyani was building a database for delivery people Uh, samya was looking at uh, you know government uh, schemes and policies and so on so and and also then there were these uh, you know several well wishers and advisors uh, advisors on board uh, you know there were senior activists on ground people just helping supporting 
um, there was Monica Rohra, Dr. Sampada Padgaonkar, there was Ruam, uh, Swati Apte, um, Gautam, Kishan Chandani, Chitra, Subramanian, lots of people. Um, and and so this is this is one part that the fact that we were organized in a way that uh, we managed to organize ourselves in a way that each person was actually focusing on uh, one or two specific areas made it uh, doable for us. But um, I think there was another thing at and then of course some of us uh, decided to do this uh, full time. So I know Kalyani was doing this full time uh, till she contracted COVID. Unfortunately, um, I asked myself a simple question. I said, "Agar teen maine." Uh, aur kuch nahi kiya. So are you going to die? Because that is what was at stake, you know. So uh, and the answer was no. And I said, okay, so then we'll just do it. So I was there kind of to anchor the project. Um, but but all of this was uh, one part, which is the organization. But I think the, the other part was the approach to the work. I think that essentially was exactly like how you make a play, how you do theater. Uh, you know, once you decide that a play is important for ABC reasons, and then there's no looking back. Then you just go ahead and you do it, you know. Uh, and everything happens. People make time for it. People subsidize. Uh, you know, well wishers come along. Money comes, and and the play happens. And and you know that's essentially the thing that at the center of you know in a rehearsal room. You know, when you enter a rehearsal room, you basically place the project at the center of the room, and everyone around it has to make it happen. And I think that's the attitude and the spirit with which we were able to work. Thank you, Sapan. Thank you for articulating that so beautifully, because that's one of the things that really excited us, actually. We said, wait a minute, this is like one of the things we guessed at was that this makes sense because theater people are used to uh, used to also be flexible on what role you'll play, how you'll jump in, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I think that's part of this. I mean, you've said it beautifully. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to throw a question at you, uh, Shanjay. Um, you know, because what happened with you is, first of all, you and your family also got COVID during this time. Uh, then you also had, uh, because of Amphan, your own center was wrecked, your own team members really suffered. Uh, so, you know, even though you've been working in community for so long, you have this balance, like this was a time where you were working for community while facing a series of crises yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, did you have dilemmas about this? How, you know, what were the key dilemmas you faced? How did you negotiate those? It would be interesting for us to know how you navigated that space between taking care of the community and taking care of yourselves? Yeah, actually, uh, there was, uh, should I call it as dilemma or not? Because as I, as I explained to you that uh, many of our actors were in crisis. Uh, their houses were destroyed. Uh, they had COVID, you know. So naturally, uh, to be a family, to be really, um, to feel the connection. I feel the connection and and since we feel the theater is an art of creating connections. So being connected, you know, we the question was that should I stay at home or run the same risk? So, no. so we all decided to uh, take the risk collectively and went to the people with proper precaution because we are also quite disturbed about this term social distancing. So there was a fear, do we have to digitalize our life? Because people are asking for online workshops, you know, which I, I don't think it is really possible doing online theater. So I was, we were actually worried that if we have to digitalize our um, cultural life, artist life, then that will be a quite a painful thing. So in order to <clears throat> make it uh, not digitalized, in order to see our spectators eye to eye, uh, we had to decide that we have to go to the people. So this will be a collective experience from the perspective of the people, from the perspective of us, the artists. So that will actually, you know, bring some effect in the future that will uh, protect our relationship with each other. And also there was, um, uh, while listening Sapan, it was very, she created a lot of hope actually, uh, optimism. It was quite inspiring. I mentioned about dysfunctional community, but also we experienced the functional community like she mentioned. So a lot of people also came together and in our case, there were 
uh, rickshaw pullers, you know, uh, subji vendors. So they are they are very marginalized economically. Economically, but even then they uh, gathered money, cooked food uh, with drinking water. They reached to the victims. So that is what also we have witnessed. Even within the theater communities, we have we our Puribar Bandhan. We formed a uh, group called Puribar Bandhan, family bond. So from Calcutta to Kochbihar, about um, 30 groups we got together and decided to deal with this problem. You know, how can we uh, go to perform theater in front of the people? So how can we uh, improvise our space so that we can at least go to the people and perform theater? So that was a big challenge and that challenge was taken up collectively. One dimension that I, I did not mention, it, it probably it was a dilemma because we were very concerned about the artist. We, the artists, we are suffering. But what about our spectators? They are also suffering. We exist because of them. So, uh, and also, we were also ignoring the question of traditional artists who perform, you know, throughout the art is their, uh, their art is their livelihood, you know. So that was disturbed. So we also reached the traditional artists with our help. Uh, and therefore, the traditional art and our uh, theater arts, they came closer in the process. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Shanjai. Thank you. Uh, Nisha, uh, one of the things that you've talked about so often when we've chatted is about how you've got cut off. Like the digitalization, what Shanjai has brought up, has actually separated you from a community which has also suffered and you don't even know how they're situated right now. Uh, I don't know if it's too early to ask you, but I was keen to understand what happens to your work with communities that has been interrupted. And is there learnings from the deep listening circle that you're thinking of or already taking back to them? You know, uh, how, how do you see that bridge back in a sense or maybe a different bridge? For sure, uh, the hope is that maybe in a month or so, uh, it, who knows with with the, the situation right now, but hopefully in a month or so, we can foray into uh, listening circles within community, you know, uh, different languages, Urdu, Hindi, Kannada is hopefully something we can do to begin to ease back into this again, right? Because without acknowledging all of that trauma that people have gone through, especially in the marginalized communities, there, you know, one has to find a way to ease oneself back in as well and not thrust back in. You know, people have changed in the last one and a half years so much. Um, a lot of students have gone back to, uh, not back, but they've gone into the workforce and there's no, no telling how many will uh, are there right now who will be, who will be back in the community space to, you know, uh, to, to, to play with theater again. Um, some of them have left the city um, and there's no scope for them coming back at all. Uh, so with the ones who are remaining and are willing, uh, the hope is that next month onwards, we kind of, you know, quietly and, and, and very slowly see what that could look like. Um, I'm feeling my way through this constantly. Uh, nobody has rule books and nobody knows, you know, all of us kind of figured it out on the fly. So I'm feeling my way through this as well. Um, just conscious about what are the needs in this room? How do we constantly check in with those needs all the time and, and see what, what, what does it take to find that connection again? Um, Sanjayda spoke about constructing the path to understand. I was, uh, you know, it, that's what it is. We're kind of constructing this again, I think, brick by brick. Um, so, yeah. Yes, thank you. And, and uh, I look forward to seeing what the journey looks like because it is a changed, I mean, no matter what happens, it's a changed dimension in a sense. And, and that flexibility and understanding is something we're all going to have to, uh, and we are engaging with and are going to have to keep being open to, I think. Yeah. Anurupa, uh, I'd like to ask you a question before I throw it open. Uh, there are already a number of questions in the Q&A box, but I, I will take my prerogative as a, as a moderator and ask you the question. Um, you know, when we spoke, you you talked about how your sense of community has changed in doing this work, your sense of the people you're connected to. And I was wondering if you could you could uh, talk a little bit about what this work has done for you 
uh, and your sense of community as a performance maker and how you now see yourself as part of the larger performance or artscape of India. Um, you know, yeah. So um, to begin with, I come from a really niche art form, which is puppet theater. You know, there are very few practitioners counting all the traditional performers and the contemporary uh, uh, performers. Uh, it's not that many. Uh, so we've always had a sense of community within, I mean, whether a puppeteer is in uh, Kanyakumari or a puppeteer is in Dibrugar or a puppeteer is in Nagore, we sort of know each other. So we've always had this sense of community. But this, uh, what the pandemic did is, um, uh, for, for instance, made us reach out to check in with each other, not only for work, but also to just check in and say, are you okay? And this was happening across across boundaries. I mean, people were calling me and I was calling them. Didn't matter if they were in a village in West Bengal or I was in a city or someone was in a smaller town in Maharashtra. It didn't matter. That was one. So this sense of this, this much larger uh, pan puppet theater community became very interesting. Uh, also in the midst of this, Southeast Asia was very hard hit. And this is the first time in so many years that I've actually connected up with that larger community with very similar resonances. So, for example, the Katputli puppeteers in, Raj, in uh, Pakistan, for example, puppeteers in Bangladesh, uh, puppeteers in Myanmar, you know, also with their political crisis. Um, we, in, in Cambodia, in uh, Thailand, we were... We were speaking and we could speak digitally. You know, we could be on a Zoom call. We could be on a WhatsApp call. And I have never felt this kind of uh, sort of um, connection and need to connect. And also with the, uh, specifically with the Delhi Kalakar Relief Network, what was incredible is I do meet theater walas, as in the actors, theater walas and dancers. But to meet so many people with a sort of... Uh, similar purpose uh, was very interesting because it began conversations about why was the crisis so deep for the performing artists? Why and what do we do in the future if such a crisis hits us? Why are we the lowest priority when policy comes into being? When you open the, when they reopen the cities and the towns and the villages, why are the performing arts the last thing to open up? And what do we do about this? You know? So um, there were many of these questions of what is hybridity? So we have known, and I've been one of them who's rejected digital spaces outright and said, no, 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 I'm never going to perform in a space like this. But the minute I started to look at the digital space, it's not like something else. So there are many conversations to be had and it's remarkable that people are begin beginning to have these. And beyond the pandemic, there is the politics of the pandemic, there's the cultural consequences of the pandemic, there is the question of what art forms are we practicing right now uh, from our home uh, foraying back in theaters or old places is uh, it's very exciting that these conversations happened earlier they would happen only when someone the initiative and organized the conference you know and people went and they sat in uh, travel and now these are things that that we're just desperate to discuss so this um, was an incredible feeling of, uh, of community. I mean, just to give you an example, I've sat through the UNIMA meeting, which is the Puppeteers Union meetings of Egypt, of uh, Libya, Algeria, uh, Thailand. I mean, it's amazing and heard the same story over and over and over again, that we are a marginalized art form. Uh, some of them had for India, we had federal government support, or almost no government support. State support, not federal government, tried again and again for very, very marginalized uh, puppeteers like the Prakuti Walas, but nothing. Uh, and to hear this, this being echoed across the world was uh, was really this, this feeling of something is changing uh, in the way performing artists have held space together. Thank you, Anurupa. Thank you. Uh, there is a question uh, which I think I will take off from what you've been saying uh, from Tim Wheeler. And he's asked for all the panelists, uh, what would you keep from this Zoom time we have been living through? What has changed forever? Anurupa, you've already sort of answered uh, a little bit uh, about that. 
uh, I wonder if, uh, if is there any one of you who would like to pick up on that question? Uh, Shandriyada, you said that you were not fond of the digital space, uh, but is there something you would still like to keep from the Zoom time? Uh, you know, or, or what do you think is, is gone and will never happen anymore? Uh, yeah, to me, I, when I'm talking about digitalizing our life, means I am actually quite concerned about direct connection. I mean, a connection needs uh, uh, a direct association. So that is why I am worried that if we have to digitalize our life, and we can see our um, prime minister is saying digital India. What does that mean? You know, digital India. Uh, we had a Samaj, we, we used to call it Samaj, because uh, our community was not totally dependent on the state and the government. They used to come together and do something uh, for the society. And that is how there were a lot of uh, social constructions like uh, institutional construction, like schools, libraries. They constructed without depending on the state. If uh, someone's daughter is in a problem, uh, I mean, if someone has to arrange his daughter's marriage, villagers would come together and share their responsibility towards that uh, purpose. So we had a Samaj, and that Samaj should not be disturbed. They should not depend completely on political parties, government. That is my concern, basically. In the name of digitalizing, we should not destroy the Samaj. But the Zoom, uh, particularly, see, I am a uh, global uh, practitioners of theater of the optics and people actually see it as one of the main point of reference. So I had to, I had to relate to my global uh, brothers and sisters and friends and uh, my artist practitioners. So in that case, I have actually learned a lot from these online things. Recently, I have introduced one of my YouTube channel called Art of Democracy. You know, team was in the uh, viewers, I mean listeners, he, he organized a program in 1999 uh, in Bradford, UK, and the program was called the Art of Democracy. Boal actually conducted, facilitated a workshop. So I have named my channel an Art of Democracy. And through Art of Democracy, I am reaching a lot of people. We are sharing our ideas. We are, uh, you know, uh, debating, arguing, discussing. So we are learning. So I am not completely rejecting this idea of coming online and speaking. Like this online platform has given me the opportunity to be connected to Sapan, Anurupa, Nisha, and many others. So that is again, after leaving, after ending this, uh, leaving this meeting, I, I have gained this. This is how actually we are also connecting ourselves with others uh, through this platform. So I, I am not dogmatic about you know, I don't want digital. That sort of dogma I don't have. I, I am against the concept of uh, uh, blind acceptance and blind rejection. I don't uh, belong to that. Uh, so naturally, you can see my activism has changed. It's it's not just shouting in the at the in the front at uh, in the front of any authority. It's also uh, bringing people into the intellectual arena. Uh, you know making them independent intellectually. So the activism has changed. Similarly, the COVID crisis has opened up the possibility of using this online platform. We are trying to convert our auditorium into a studio where we can perform and all uh, the whole world can see. So we are just setting up that uh, instruments installation. We are going to install that. Uh, so it's a, uh, you know, don't, uh, transition with the time, yeah. yeah. So if I, I can add, just add, yeah, I <laughs> please, yes, I was going to ask you. Yeah. No, I just want to add one little thing to what uh, Shandrada said. Uh, I think um, yes, uh, the the pos there are lots of possibilities that have opened up, uh, and yes, at the same time, nothing can replace the live. But there are possibilities that the internet and Zoom and all of this has uh, presented and opportunities. But it's it's not okay that you know half the country does not have access to internet and does not have have access to good speed and you know so we are talking of democracy also within like democratic space and all of that but only within a certain class and section of people who have access to it and that is not okay at all so that's what is uh, yeah a problem here thank you Sabha. go ahead nisha i just want yeah i just wanted to add um of course um 
what Sapan said is absolutely true. There is that whole divide. The digital divide is very real. But I think what this is also allowed uh, is the breaching of bubbles within the, the group that has the digital access, right? There is a much more diverse, um, diverse bodies in a Zoom room than, than I was seeing in real rooms before. Um, you know, there are, uh, in, for example, in the listening circle itself, there are many people who would be, would identify as queer, um, sitting and sharing a story with people who have never met anyone who would identify as queer. That is a, that, that's big. That's a, that's a huge, you know, win. Um, there are um, artist friends of mine, theater maker friends of mine who uh, woke up to the uh, reality that we have to frame ourselves in this larger structure that that we can't afford to, uh, to, 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 to ignore that larger structure anymore. And that I think is also a win that, that, that we have access to ideas and imaginations um, seemingly like that now, at least some of us do. And that can be quite transformative. Uh, I'm hopeful that it can be uh, transformative. Um, you know, th this, I spent a, a year saying, I don't know how to do digital theater. I don't know how to do digital theater. And then in the summer, when the second wave happened, in June, the, the, the group that was putting together the play for the summer came back and said, okay, listen, uh, you know, we have to do this digitally now. And, you know, suddenly there was the, the ability to look at how else to do this. And that came from community. That came from having access to so many different theater makers also who were imagining spaces differently and imagining their form differently. So I think for a lot of people I know, and for me personally, it's the imagination is richer because of what has happened. Um, Thank you, Nisha. Yeah. Um, Anurup, are you there? I'm not seeing you. Hello? Okay, we'll wait for her to get back on. In the meantime, Chandra, uh, there are two questions for you. Uh, one from Mangai, uh, which who says, what are the main recommendations we need on migrant workers? And from someone called PB, who is asking, is there room to engage with the children of the community in the work that you do? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, we have uh, we, we have actually experienced, we have noticed uh, the domestic violence increased in the family during the COVID crisis. Because the migrant workers, they came back home, which actually they, they were not used to um, spend time with their uh, wives so much before. They used to stay in other states. So naturally, the wives went to panchayats, wives went to banks, wives, wives attended a self-help group meeting. So they developed friendship and sometimes the friendship with the um, main things like that. So that the main folk did not, uh, you know, they couldn't encourage it. So they did not see their wives so independent and uh, uh, relating to the opposite gender uh, so smartly that so naturally it caused, you know, the internalized patriarchy came into the surface and there was a crisis. Also, the during this, when the family is going through this situation, naturally that will affect the uh, mental health of the children. And the children were, the schools were closed. So therefore they had no opportunity to mingle with their friends. So no mingling. So sit at home and, you know, because the education is online, so you have a smartphone. So the smartphone and you, there is no other, people or father, parents, nobody exists except your smartphone. Naturally, uh, this loneliness inside uh, also caused problems with the children. So now we are, uh, we, are, we are going to the young adults and particularly the boys because they find they, they were absolutely excluded from this whole process of you know, educating the community, educating the children. So, and they also uh, think that they are main, so they have the responsibility to look after their family. So they, they got migrated because they have to be the man, you know, 
So these are all, this is also the patriarchal constructions. So uh, we thought there is a need to address all these things. So we are introducing what we call introspective theater, where the theater space encourages you to look at yourself as your own spectator. So you are the spectator of your own actor. So you can see how you act. You can see the conflicts you have inside. You can clearly watch. Your mind can watch your mind. You are the observer and observe at the same time. So this, this method actually makes you observer and observe. So this is how we are creating space for the children and their mother to understand the conflicts, to rationalize it. So we have started. I am too. It is too early for me to uh, give you more insight about how it is uh, impacting on the children. We have just started. And uh, what was the other question of Manga Mangai? That what, what should are, be, huh? yeah what? about the migrant workers? What, what are the yeah yeah? So we are really in a, a difficult crisis because uh, you know these lacunas are such uh, in the laws that uh, you can't say anything to the uh, owners, to the contractors, uh, you have no option to accuse, uh, to, to you know, uh, act against their intention. So uh, people are, we are giving them the, we are going to the people in each villages, we have spectators committee, and in those committees we have started uh, you know, conducting workshops on legal aspects of migrant workers. They don't know. Many of them do not know. Most of them do not know that these are the laws that exist for them. So we are just letting them know about. So we are creating a legal awareness by conducting this kind of workshops. And we think that is the, there is a need to do it. And at the same time, the, in this representative democracy, we all know that uh, the representatives and the electorates, they hardly relate to each other once in a five years, once in five years they relate. So we want to uh, take the voices of the uh, workers, migrant workers, unorganized sectors workers, their voices to the representatives using this legislative theater, the form of this theater. So in a way we are trying to uh, strengthening the democracy and uh, unless we do it, we, we, we have just started. So unless we do it, we won't, uh, we, we, we won't tell you, we won't be able to tell you, uh, you know, the impact uh, it has already created, but we are visualizing an impact that we are quite dedicated and committed to take the voices of the people from the ground level to the representatives in the parliament. That is what we want to do. And everyone through various forms, I think um, we should do this. And we will we will be able to relate to those people who want to do that. Thank you, Shanjada. Um, Anurupa, there's a question for you. Uh, is there from PB? Uh, is there a way to transition emergency intervention into sustained support for distressed puppeteers, families in post-COVID times, whatever that is? Is um so I, I would like to answer it in this way that uh, the, the, what began as distress, uh, uh, answer to distress calls, especially in the Rajasthani uh, Kataputri communities, which as some of you may be aware are settled across North India, right up to West India. So there's Gujarat, Rajasthan, um, Madhya Pradesh, uh, all the way to even, even West Bengal has a little, little group of uh, Kataputri wallas. Uh, now, the, the need to understand is what is marginalization in puppet theater. Puppeteers, especially in the traditional format, are rarely just puppeteers. They also come from some sort of farming or artisanal background. So they are not dependent only on puppetry. They also have their own land. We observed during this particular crisis that the ones who were really badly off are the ones who were landless, which is the gypsy community or the wandering community uh, of Katputri Vanas. And they've often settled in cities and towns. And they become then the daily wage worker, working artists of the cities and towns. This also includes freelance artists. A lot of freelance artists who work for a dance group here or, or uh, make a mask there or work, uh, you know, make a puppets for somebody in a school. Uh, this becomes a super vulnerable community. So in the long run, 
there are two kinds of uh, things which which the puppeteers union is trying to do right now one is to provide a slightly long term uh, slightly better uh, amount of money to artist family uh, who have maybe enough to eat or just about enough to eat but don't have any access to their traditional audience anymore because of complete lockdowns or partial lockdowns or worry or illness but the ones who are in city uh, one of the ways that this has been responded uh, to is several companies independent companies especially have started little grants um and this is what unama aims to do in the long run is to have little artist grants for projects and performances uh, so already tram art trust for uh, for instance created a, a fundraiser and uh, an art grant for four or five artists similar things have happened uh, across um membership in unama uh, people who had the possibility to raise the uh, uh, raise funds were able to give out small time art grants one very crucial thing and i think it was uh, it was uh, i don't know who this, maybe several people said this on the panel is artists are they don't want dole they don't want money as arms they don't want uh, rickshaw they want to work and that's something that we are very focused on in the long run is how do you sustain work where you link the audi audience directly to people to so audiences turn to funder of work or even bet commissioner of work is what unama is now trying to do which is what has happened for instance with the leather shadow puppeteers tolu uh, bombala tem puppeteers of kanyakumari right now. yeah thank you anurupa and that answers the question Uh, and in fact, Sapan, I'd like to connect to you about the reskilling initiative because my guess is it's also coming from a response to something like that. Uh, the you know you said you said some, that some people were already uh, yes. already doing other kinds of work, but the reskilling initiative is taking it further. It's actually asking people to consider. Uh, and and I'm interested in knowing whether it's interim livelihood you're asking them to consider, or what is it like? How is one thinking of? Uh, um. so it's this is a slightly long term thing i think uh, what we've just managed to do is do a survey um and figure out where people are at uh, how many people have started their own businesses at what stage are they at um you know what are the skills that they possess what is if given the opportunity what is it that they would like to do those kind of uh, that kind of survey um and um and then the idea is to a the two things to it a we want to do sort of business listings uh, so there's a website which is being made and all of that will be shared within the community so um, so that you know we all have access to these services and businesses and all of that so that is number one point the point number two is um the whole reskilling program is again we don't know that's the thing like people who have left jo gaon chale gaye we don't know whether they're going to really come back or not um and also then others who are now uh, doing these businesses we don't know eventually whether they would return to the theater because it does seem really tough um but at this point the idea is to actually provide skill training uh we we are tying up with some ngos which specialize in uh, this sector and uh and they uh, for, especially for urban uh, you know uh, people and uh, for for what they call micro and nano home setups so they'll they'll teach you basic things about why how to take your business seriously how it is you know right now it's all ad hoc what you get you do and you know it's it's it depends on where you get work and then next month you're doing something else and then theaters will open and then you'll start what happens to the business then so they they basically train you how to think uh, about you know seriously taking yourself as a business person um and they and they they, they set goals for you you know ki ek mahine mein bombay jaise shehar mein aapko 25000 rupaye kamane chahiye ek chote micro business se so those kind of things so i think we are at that stage um where we'll set these things into motion and i think time will tell whether how many of us will be able to uh, sort of return to theater the way we've known it sure um i have a question from arunthi ghosh uh, for sapan and for nisha uh, she's asking what is the hardest challenge for you when working with community when doing this work with community sapan <laughs> nisha you want to go you go ahead sure. um with the uh with the food relief um personally it has been just uh, fighting the exhaustion and keeping it going 
uh, has been really hard. Uh, and I feel like, uh, um, you know, it, it's endless because the system has collapsed around these communities. It's not that they need food only. Like Sapan was saying, you know, there's medical, there's, uh, there's, there's um, um, school fees to be paid at, at this time. In fact, you know, in a, in a day or two, I'll be putting out a requirement for close to three and a half lakhs. And I don't know where the money is going to come from. You know, a couple of us are like brainstorming on how to do this. So it, it is endless and it, it can get exhausting. And to keep that going, because to keep telling yourself that the one is trying to step in for a structural collapse and, and to constantly talk to oneself and to each other, you know, whoever's involved, the group that's doing this with you, to keep telling each other that we can do this, but we've, we've got to not get overwhelmed by it. For, personally, that's been a huge challenge. And one of the ways in which we try to address that was to put out how Bangalore Pledge project works. It's quite easily replicable. The, 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 the model is quite scalable. Uh, yeah. it, basically, the people who are doing the connecting up, the, we are, we're the people who do connecting up of the ones who have the the funds and the communities, right? And directly people transfer the funds into the store partners and the, the person in need or the communities in need come and pick it up from the store. So it's quite transparent. It's, it's credibility is high with something like this. You know, there's no money coming into personal accounts and things like that, all of that. And we really try to go and tell people that it's easy to do this. And, you know, here's a step-by-step -step guide as to how you can do it. And it was very difficult for people to step in. Um, so, and, and so what is a personal challenge is also a systemic challenge. Unless we step in, more people step in, um, you know, we can't, I, th I think it's very important for us to change this mindset of being independent. Dependency is not a bad, is not a bad thing. We are meant to be, as human beings, as artists in the theater, we're constantly depending on each other. So this sense of we have to be all the time independent and figure things out by ourselves, um, it's exhausting and it's really overwhelming. So to communicate that also to people outside of that belief system, how do we get people to understand that, you know, food rights it, it is a matter of right, it's not charity. So you must, it, it, you know, there is a responsibility you hold. Um, to step out of your compound and check what's happening around you, you know, and gather your resources together. So one of the things that we're really trying to do is to address this, this exhaustion, because it's related, is to tell people that it's not that you need to dedicate your entire day to this, uh, to this from where you are, you know, with the roles that you are capable of playing and the resources that you have and the social capital that you have. There are many things you're able to do. So talk to us, we'll help you figure that out because it's not possible for a few people to do this. This is going to take time to, to, um, uh, to you know, the, the, it'll take time for the system to even figure it out if at all, right? We can see how many ways multiple systems have just given up on people of, you know, around the margins. So it will take many more of us. To, to imagine small and big ways of stepping in. Um, so yeah, so the exhaustion and along with that, tied to that, this need to reach out to more people and bring them into the fold, invite them into this. So I'm going to tag on Neil Chaudhary's question to you, Nisha, and also to you, Sapan, with Arundhati's. And so Neil Chaudhary is asking what happens, uh, you know, what, have, what, if, what, if, what happens when somebody does get overwhelmed with the work and their capacity to do the work? You know, uh, what happens if, if, you know, do you do you feel you have to, I mean, there is your own mental health to take care of also. There is your own exhaustion to take care of also. How do you deal with that? Has that ever happened for you? It, so it, it does. And over time, I've personally figured out what, you know, works for me. I know that I these are my needs and these are some boundaries that I have drawn around for myself. I know Shalini has similar, you know, ways to deal with this as well because she's also a psychotherapist. And so in you know, the last one and a half years has been, very demanding on her because all of her clients are going through these intense, you know, trauma. So I know we have our ways to do this. One simple thing that we would do, and again, this is so related to our theater practice, is um, during the madness of the second wave, Charlie and I would get into some body movement work together for one hour. And this, this was in the afternoon and a friend was doing this with us. 
right? So that was a way for us to, no matter what was going on, no matter how many phone calls we would miss in that one hour, food relief, medical relief, we would take that one hour and just get back into the body again. And so simple, you know, simple things, uh, Anurupa talked about checking in with each other. That's just become such a given now. You know, there, 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 are, there is a community that's constantly checking in who understands that this is exhausting. Last year, I, I was a mess, to be honest. The first wave, I, I was just spent and I was, it was miserable because the intensity to keep it going for so long. But this, this time around, I think I'm, I know, I know what it takes. And also the knowledge that I can't not step in. For me, self-care is stepping in for community. It is part of it. I can't, I can't distance the two. So that reality also sits with, uh, you know, uh, with everything else that needs to happen. Thank you, Nisha. Sapan, if you would respond to those questions. I think what Nisha said towards the end is what resonates with me that uh, actually it kept all of us sane. This work just kept us all sane and we all wanted to do it. Uh, and that was the only way to live at that time. So I, uh, yeah, I mean, and I've not had the time to process uh, things the way I guess Nisha has in the, because of the listening circle, because of the quality of the nature of the work. Um, but the other thing that one felt was, uh, you know, you suddenly now experience the possibilities that are, you know, the things that are possible by just us coming together, you know, uh, and, and possibilities that emerge because of organization and the power of that and and not having that and not re really knowing ki wo long term mein kaise hoga, you know how are we going to do this and can we do this and i think that has been a question that has really uh, been troubling and is something that uh, i mean it's a question that we should all be discussing and trying to figure out a way because it is possible to do so much um, all of us have been doing different things and many more other people so yeah, I mean, the power of organization is something that one has experienced firsthand. And then uh, then how do we, where do we go from here is the question. Wonderful. I think that's actually a great question to end with and leave it open for everybody to think about where do we go from here. Uh, it's, uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, all of you panelists for, for sharing your work, but also just sharing your thoughts and your um, responses so candidly and so openly. So thank you. Really, it's been a fantastic conversation listening to all of you. There's a ton of chats, which I will read afterwards, but they're going to hit 100 if somebody puts one more chat in there, which is kind of cool. Um, so really, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening, for staying on. Uh, and uh, this, I think, is going to be available on Facebook. So if you want any of your friends to uh, see it who couldn't make it to the session, please do share with them. I think there are questions. Uh, okay, Nisha has answered about and you, and made it hundred. Is that okay? Uh, she's answered. There are questions about where the fundraising can happen. I think Arundhati has uh, put uh, connects to um, links to these different organizations. But if anybody else wants to support the work, because it is continuous work that they are doing uh, amongst many other people. So if people want to step in and support, uh, please ask us, and we will uh, you know connect you and send the links. Um, We'll put it on Facebook for you if necessary. Uh, but really, I do want to thank all of you so very much uh, for taking your time out to do this and for taking us through the really inspiring and humbling work that you guys have been doing. You give us energy. Uh, you know, it's it gives us hope. And it is very, very dark time. So these are the spaces of light, I guess, that all of us get drawn to. Um, before I let you go, I want to very quickly say, um, that uh, we have two upcoming sessions uh, and we have one on space. We'll be looking at how theater practitioners who run spaces, uh, artists who run spaces, how they have been dealing during the pandemic and what they have been coming up with. And that is on Wednesday, 29th September. And on 27th October, Wednesday, we will be looking at experiments, what people have, you know, being forced into this digital space, what are the kinds of experiments people in the theater space have been doing. Um, so uh, yes, thank you very, very much again. Uh, panelists, I'm going to send you a quick WhatsApp. We forgot to discuss with you, this with you beforehand. So please check your WhatsApp as soon as you get off. Uh, but uh, otherwise, thank you all so very much. And we thank can- you, Thank you, Samira. Thank you, Samira. Thank, you, Samira. Yeah. thank you for holding this together. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's just for me, this is, this is a gift. So thank you. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.